everyone to Municipal Affairs. I'm Christopher Brown. Today, we delve into a pressing yet disturbing issue within the world of municipal governance, the dark and often dangerous reality of harassment, bullying, and intimidation faced by our local elected officials. On May 16, 2024, detectives in the major crime section of the Greater Sudbury Police Criminal Investigation Division initiated a criminal harassment investigation after receiving a complaint from a city of Greater Sudbury councillor. The harassment, which began in 2022, escalated over a two-year period, culminating in incidences that left the councillor fearing for their safety. On May 21st, detectives arrested and charged an 81-year-old man with criminal harassment. Since his release on an undertaking with a scheduled court appearance of June 19th, Ward 7 Counselor Natalie Labee has bravely come forward, revealing the extent of the harmful messages and threats she has endured since her election in the fall of 2022. Elected to represent Ward 7, the counselor's inbox was soon flooded with vitriolic messages. Now, according to the counselors, things came to a head when the accused man started keeping track of her movements, driving by her residence and taking notes if her car wasn't in the driveway and asking her where she was. She decided to report the accused to the police when he visited her home twice in one day. Now, this disturbing trend is not isolated to this counselor. A 2021 report by the U.S.-based National League of Cities titled On the Front Lines of Today's Cities, Trauma, Challenges, and Solutions highlights a significant rise in harassment, threats, and violence directed at local officials. 87% of surveyed officials reported an increase in attacks, with 81% experienced such harassments firsthand, often on social media platforms. Now, we had the opportunity to sit down with the counselors just days after this news of the arrest broke. In our conversation, the counselor shares the harrowing journey she faced since her election, her thoughts on the broader pattern of harassment of politicians, and her hopes that by telling her story, she can inspire other elected officials to stand strong. This is a story of resilience, courage, and the ongoing fight to protect our democracy. This is municipal affairs. Councillor, I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your day to do this interview. Um, last week, it was announced by the major crime section of the Greater Sudbury Police Criminal Investigation Division that uh, a criminal harassment charge was pressed against a resident of the Greater Sudbury because of some harassment of a city councillor. You have come out and said you were that councillor. You are the one that uh, went to the police to ask for them to look into this matter. Can you explain how we got to where we are today in your own words that you had to take this step to stop this harassment? Sure. And I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about it because I think it's I think it's important. It's an important topic for people to understand. And so after I first got elected, the emails started coming in and I had been um, I kind of been warned and given the heads up by the outgoing counselor uh, about these situations. And I really kind of minimized it at first. Uh, this is not my first time in politics, but when I was in politics from 2010 to 2014, social media really wasn't as prevalent then. It was just kind of getting an uptick, right? Uh, so we really didn't uh, have those kinds of experiences, thank, thank goodness. Um, so at first, the emails were just kind of getting me up to speed on different issues that were important to him. Uh, but they, they really had an undertone and some words that were, you know, not very nice, not directly towards me, just not nice in general, uh, you know, attacks on minority groups, attacks on uh, different people and languages they speak and where they come from and their backgrounds, um, homophobic type of rhetoric. Um, again, like just things that are not in my wheelhouse of belief systems. And I responded back to this person and I said, you know, uh, I, I, I want to take your concerns seriously, but I'm having a really hard time spending uh, any kind of effort in responding to you because you're not being polite in the words that you're using. And I really would like you to consider how to be a little bit more mindful with the words you're using because they're quite offensive. And I want to remind you that I'm not under obligation to communicate with you if you are using those kind of harassing words. And 
you know, right away it was like, well, if you don't have big shoulders, maybe you need to step down right away, quit wasting our time. Um, you know, maybe you're not cut out for this kind of work if you can't take the heat. Um, just those kinds of comments. So I've really, um, I really made interaction very minimal and because of that, and all of my colleagues were getting CC'd on these emails, um, lots of local media, media abroad, right, as far as Toronto um, would get CC'd on this. And then I found out that um, 30 to 40 of his followers, uh, those are his words, um, you're not the only one that has followers, Natalie, right? But not just Natalie, but my name in capital letters with a whole bunch of E's and a whole bunch of exclamation points, like he's yelling and he's trying to make a statement with me, you know, these BCC lists were getting CC'd on this. So things started escalating because he would um, mention the street that I live on. He would mention uh, my vehicle. Uh, he would mention, uh, he started cropping pictures of me from the internet and using that in a way that he would snip them and make disparaging comments. If I was seen in a photo with someone had, who was a minority group, that would be targeted. It just escalated and escalated. And this person lives in the community that I live in. So it's a small community. People know where I live. And it just escalated to a point where, um, you know, I did block him on social media because he was using um, my presence in the community against me in these emails. And it's starting to get very unsettling. So when I said to him, you know, um, I don't know why you're so preoccupied with my whereabouts, um, but it's very creepy to me. Like it's harassment. I, I don't know why you're you're so preoccupied with it. And he just disparaged me even more and, and just, you know, I just really minimalized it, minimized it um, and made fun of me about with things. And that that's fine. I, I don't care. I have thick shoulders. I got big shoulders. I can handle it. But then he showed up at my house and knowing full well, he did not expect my spouse or me to be home because our vehicles were not in the yard. Um, went up to my contractors who were doing some work on the front of my house, asked for a piece of you know, material that was extra and then started disparaging me to them up and down. And they had no idea that I was a city councillor. Um, and then my spouse happened to be home. He looked out the window and saw this person leaving the house and asked the contractors what happened. And then, of course, my spouse went to have a conversation with him about it. And that's where we're at. I just said, you know, no boundary is is there's there is no boundaries with him he feels he needs to have all access to me and disparage me at all costs he's been putting talking about my full-time career online in comments it's just a really really unhealthy level of obsession at this point and i really don't have a lot of faith in the justice system moving forward but i just felt like enough is enough and it had to stop so i want to start by talking about the role of the counselor for a second, if you don't mind. Um, sure. You you you, you said that you kind of were aware of this situation, this gentleman prior to entering into politics with the prior counselor who you took over for in 2022. Um, we often say that municipal politicians have to take the blunt of the criticism or the challenges because that's what you've signed up for. At what point of time did you feel like that line was crossed and you now felt like it was not engagement, but it was more harassment? Right. And you know, when you do go into politics, you have to have an open mind and understand that you're putting yourself out there for criticism and scrutiny. And there's a healthy level of that. And there's an expectation. So no one goes into that thinking that, you know, you're a Teflon frying pan for that, you know, the public deserves to have um, freedom of speech and to be critical of decisions that we make, and they're not going to like all of them. And I'm fine with that. But like I say, when it starts going into your personal life, and um, it just seems like there's personal attacks involved, then that's where it goes, it, it goes over the line. So um, this was continuous. And it started to escalate even more, uh, you know, because of my political affiliation. I've never really been one, like, you know, as a counselor, we really, you know, we're, we're seen to be not affiliated with a certain party or, you know, bipartisan and that kind of thing. But um, just being in pictures with certain people of a different political party would set this person off and just, 
it was just, it just went, went across. So, you know, it's fine to, to not agree with decisions that we're going to make as a municipal government or the province or federally, um, but taking it to that personal level where, um, you know, you're putting us on display in that way, in that manner, it's just too far, right? If you start, you start following me where I am in the community while I'm representing the city and um, making comments and emails like, where are you off to this weekend? Oh, don't worry. If you don't tell me, somebody else will, right? Like, is that necessary? It's it's really, it, it goes to the different level. First off, that's very frightening. But we're seeing a rise of this type of harassment towards municipal leaders over the last few years. In Quebec alone, they're seeing uh, municipal leaders step down. They're seeing municipal re leaders resign because of the vitriol and the uh, negativity that they're facing from their elected officials, whether it be harassment, online bullying, like you uh, dealt with over the last two years. What role do we as a citizen, as a community play in trying to stop that with realizing that with the rise of social media, it's possibly that we're never going to be able to stop this online harassment and bullying? Yeah, and I think, you know, from the way that I tackle social media always is I ask myself this question, am I being helpful or hurtful with my comments? And I don't think enough people are checking themselves before they press send. Um, you know, some people will be um, disagreeing with something, which is fine. Of course, freedom of speech. We don't want to be censoring. You know, it's not about censorship or anything like that. But when it, you know... The disparaging comments is is the, is the next level where you're making it personal uh, with the insults and the attacks and those kinds of things. Um, so that really does wear down on a lot of people. Uh, most people, we don't want to, you know, especially when we're going into this with a, a good heart and a good mind and you want to make um, um, some positive differences and, in, in, you know, enhance the quality of life for the municipality that you're representing. And I don't think anybody goes into politics saying, yeah, throw it at me. Tell me what a piece of garbage I am every single day, please. That's just going to make me so great in the work that I'm doing, right? Um, but I just think that it's a it's a good balance. And as, as mature adults, I think we should be being a little bit more mindful of the words that we're using. There's criticism, and then there's that personal element that you're putting in. So that's what's getting to a lot of people, I think. And, you know, it's not just the way the public are dealing with, with us as, as politicians. It's how politicians are reacting and interacting with each other. I'm sure, you know, you follow the headlines in municipalities. There's councillors behaving badly as a title in, in so many things of how they're treating each other um, and harassment in, um, within those systems. Um, it's, it's not for the faint of heart, that's for sure. But I just think that just coming out with these stories more and just being mindful and just sharing that there's a healthy level of debate or criticism that's expected, but there is a point where it goes overboard. Okay, I'm going to ask a very, and it's going to sound very sexist question right now, and I do apologize for this. Okay, I'm just I'm just going to have to ask it, and I apologize if it comes out incorrectly here. Do you think this would have been different if you were a man? You know, people have suggested that to me, and I'm I'm I don't consider myself a feminist as much as I'm a really strong and confident and brave and courageous woman overall. I've I've always led by example in that way. I, I really don't want to label it at that as that. Uh, I feel that because things escalated the way that it did, that it was a big part of me being a woman. Uh, it's hard to admit that part because I would think that in society, we've come a long way since, you know, 80 years ago or so. Um, but it's definitely statistics show that that is definitely um, an accurate statement. Because the reason I asked that is because when this the news broke, there was uh, media reports that other fellow members of your council also felt harassment, bullying from online sources. Even the uh, local Timmins James Bay uh, MP also faced uh, intimidation and harassment. Um, what role does the municipality have to play in 
protecting their elected officials, do you think? Did you talk to anyone at the Greater Sudbury municipality to say this is go this is what's going on? Or was it something that you internalized and you and your husband dealt with because it was more towards you and not as a counselor? No, so you know it's interesting because ironically, um, or coincidentally, this same person has been um, a mainstay of criticism to an unhealthy level within all at all areas of the city for a very really long time, targeting our staff, different levels from entry level right up to management. In fact, the contents of a lot of the emails uh, were not just snippets of my face, but also our mayor, our police chief, uh, several uh, directors in different departments, either infrastructure or planning or uh, leisure services, whatever it could be. And it's like, there's a target wall. Like this person has a file of people that have just, he's just miffed at for what other reason and just puts us on display in these emails. And again, media outlets from across everywhere, everybody's getting this. And it's the BCC list of who thinks that, you know, they're on this list where um, they're in receipt of this and they think it's okay. I actually had two people that are on the BCC list reach out to me over the last year and say, wow, counselor, I'm so sorry that you are receiving these kinds of emails. Um, but my question to them is, why are you still on the list? Right. I appreciate you reaching out to me about it, but why? Right. It's just feeding the audience for it. Um, and and uh, that's it's it's not OK. It's just not OK. But I went to the city, you know, I was thinking, wow, this is getting a little bit crazy. Um, and um, the the it wasn't it's not just once a week. Right. <laughs> like it's almost every single day, uh, sometimes up to six times a day. So I'm not talking about this person said something not nice to me 10 times over two years. No, it's excessive. Right. So our municipality actually brought forward a vexatious and frivolous bylaw to try and protect our staff and from certain people in the community, because this person's not the only one. There's a few in every ward, but I think if you quantify that in a city of 168,000, we're still really, it's very minimal in nature. However, those types of people collectively make a lot of noise and they cause a lot of damage. And it's a snowball effect because if our employees are feeling harassed and, um, uh, targeted like that, they're going to quit. It's creating a cultural, a negative cultural um, um, environment for them outside of all the other challenges they have in a working environment with that many people working around them, right? So if you've got the public disparaging you that way, you have to start weighing, like, am I going to stay in this role? Is it really worth it? Is it really worth my mental health and my stress that I'm being attacked at this level every day at work? Uh, so can we I, have been can I interject for a second? Can I interject with that yeah. statement there for a second? I apologize, now, uh, Councillor, for asking this question, but did you ever feel that way? Because you're right. When people feel the negativity, when they feel the constant bullying, they feel the constant harassment, they will look internally and say, you know what, this is not worth it. This is not worth it. And we are seeing counselors resign across this country because of the online hate, uh, vitriol that they're getting, not only, like you said, not only from residents, but also from internally, from council members, from their administration, even from their own family. And it's just like, okay, enough is enough. I can't deal with this. I have to move on. At any point in time, did you ever think to yourself, you know what, this is not going to stop and it could potentially go even further and I have to make a decision here. Do I stand? Do I stay here and stand tall? And or do I go away and let him win? Did you ever have that moment in your in this last two years? Not once. And I think you. it's because I, I'm, I'm in this job for the right reasons. I know what my role is as a municipal leader and not a lot of people, as much as they're critical, no one <laughs> else has put their name on the ballot to put themselves out for that. And I, I have the leadership skills and, and the caring and the compassion and the connection to my community to do a good job. It has not derailed me on any level. Yes, I've, I've shared my concerns and, and my frustration with my colleagues. Uh, many of them have been very supportive of that. Uh, anyone I've reached out to say, you know, I can't believe this. But 
I do shrug it off because you have to have big shoulders when you go into politics. That's 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 a given. Um, but I'm not. It has not derailed me at all, Chris. Uh, you know, some of the articles actually that have been um, prevalent in the news regarding this issue have actually used um, rather unflattering pictures of me, uh, kind of maybe perpetuating the idea that I'm more of a victim than I am and that I'm, I'm looking very somber in nature in the photos. Uh, I had one of my high school teachers call me uh, and say, are you okay? My dear Natalie, I can't believe it. You're such a mess. You're crying on TV. And I was like, mm, no, it's just a really bad still shot because that was from two years ago and that was not an interview of when it was an upsetting interview. It was just a still shot they decided to use. You know, it's that's the way media works, right? They're going to click on the on the article. I just wanted people to know this is not affecting me to that level. I feel unsafe about the unhealthy nature that this person's obsession is with me. There are parameters. There are there are laws around that, and I use those tools to help me. It has not derailed me at all. And um, I have work to do. I have important work to do. And this is one just little speed bump along the way. And I'm using the tools uh, uh, that I have at my disposal. I have a very healthy sense of self-esteem and confidence in the work that I'm doing. I've had leadership roles over the last 25 years of my life. And rest assured, Chris, um, this has, it has not crossed my mind once. Good to hear. So since the news is broken, there have been media reports that have been have made this public. You have come forward saying you are the one that has been facing this harassment, not only in the last six months, but over the last two years almost. Um, what's been the reaction locally from the residents of your community? Did they know this was going on? Did Have they been sending you supportful messages? Are they on your side? Can you give me a sort of sense of where the residents of your community and even Ward 7 are right now when it comes to this issue? You know, I've, I've had an outpouring of support from people, not just in my own community, but across the city and even beyond. People are hearing this story, reaching out to me through email, Facebook, uh, personal phone calls. It's been really wonderful to see. I think most people understand and they empathize and they're like, I had no idea that this was going on. This is so shameful. And, you know, you got the one or two. And, and I had one woman, a woman that... Uh, wrote well look at the mouth on her no wonder people are upset no wonder he's he's harassing her right like yeah I got a so mouth you got harassed me. about the harassment is what you're saying yeah so and that's the thing so and that's often the case people will come forward and then you're more of a victim you're victimized even more because you came forward and then people wonder why didn't you say something sooner well the majority of people just don't have um, they feel like they are such a victim that they shouldn't speak out because they're going to be criticized even more or not believed, right? Not believed. And that's a big part. Doesn't matter if you're a municipal politician, any level of politics, no matter what you are, victims on any level are not coming forward until many years later sometimes because they just don't feel, um, you know, they, they second guess themselves and they just don't want to have that target on their back. So what can we do? What can we do here in the now? Because there might be a councillor, a mayor, an MP, an MPP, or even just someone at work who might be listening to this episode right now and saying, you know what, I'm going through the exact same thing, or I'm going through similar things that the councillor has gone through. Someone is harassing me, someone is bullying me, and I don't know where to turn. Um, it took you until literally the guy, the, the person, the accused and I have to say that just to make sure that I'm covering my basis here um he showed up at your house he literally followed you he stalked you and then you said okay enough is enough I can't go on and we need to be able to put this we need to move on from this uh sort of ordeal what advice would you give someone else that potentially might say I, I agree with what Natalie says, but I'm not sure if people are going to believe me because I'm not a counselor. I'm just a lonely staff member in a municipality. I'm just a rural municipal leader that might not have as many people who can back me like Natalie does. You know, I just think that 
if you're running for politics and you have that level of leadership, you should already have that strong conviction in you to do what's right. There's never a wrong time to do what's right. And we need municipal leaders. We need strong municipal, provincial and federal leaders. We need strong people that can um, focus on the work that they're, they've been uh, tasked to do without getting distracted. And you just go within yourself and you, and, and you just do it. Um, you need to have courage to take on these types of positions in the first place. And you just need to find that courage to do it. And um, I just want to let you know, Chris, like when this all happened, I'm aware of the federal statutes and laws and freedom of speech and censorship and all of that stuff. There's such a fine line. So, you know, when I first talked to the police about the racist and the hate speech and stuff like that, not necessarily directed towards me, but me in general and being part of those communities, like the queer community or or minority events that I was going out in the in the community, you know, people will say, oh, you want to have um, photo ops. It's not an election year, counselor. Why are you doing so many photo ops? You know, there's very few people that say that. The majority of people want to see us out and engaging in our communities. We should be able to go on social media, share all the wonderful things that are going on in our city and put uh, awareness to those causes and all of the wonderful time that volunteers and different groups are are, are, are putting in to enhance the, our city and make it greater all the time uh, without having people say that to us, right? Uh, it doesn't, it didn't dissuade me. I know what my job is. I know what my role is. And it's important to understand that we don't get paid extra for that. We're choosing time away from our families to, to attend these types of events because we know that it's important to those people and to those groups. And that doesn't, that doesn't derail me at all from, from the work that I'm doing. I'm really proud to represent the city and I do it in a really professional way. And I have so many people supporting me and encouraging me. And they are very grateful when any of us show up to their events, not only in our own wards, but across the city. That is very, very evident. So I try to channel that positivity. But for people like with this situation, Chris, I asked for anonymity. When the police came forward and said, hey, this has escalated to criminal harassment beyond just the regular amount of you know, vitriol and things that we would receive, this went to that other level. And especially with the escalation, I asked for anonymity. I wanted to ensure anonymity of the person who was being charged as well, because I live in a small community. Having said that, he's outed himself. He's told people, can you imagine, can you believe she's had me charged? You think she's got the nerve to do that? You know, he's not supposed to have indirect or direct contact with me, still talking about me, still, and has outed himself. But shortly after the press release came out, my phone started blowing up and I answered the phone. It was a reporter from CTV News and they said, counselor, we just heard that so-and-so was charged with criminal harassment against you. Would you like to talk about that? And I had this instant sinking, Chris. I said, oh my gosh, I was promised anonymity because I just want this to go away. How did you know? And he hesitated and he, and he just got quiet and he said, you know, counselor, We've been CC'd on these hundreds of emails. We get them every day. And I'm like, of course you are. I know you are. Why was I, why was I not putting that two and two together? You know? So that's why I felt like, you know what? How many people, um, the everyday Joe Blow person on the street doesn't know, but a lot of prominent prominent entities, um, people that might are they believing any of the stuff that they're reading about me? It's it's tarnishing my reputation. And these people. I'm, I'm proud to say are behind me a hundred percent and they knew and they want to support my message through this. So I think that it can be empowering for people, but it's also a double-edged sword, Chris, because I'm coming forward with this and I'm, I'm saying this happens, but how many people are now going to not step forward because they're saying, Oh man, I don't want that to ever happen to me. That doesn't seem worth the stress and the chaos that being a municipal leader and what we get paid or, you know, depending on whether you're rural or a city, if there's a big discrepancy in what you get paid for what you have to endure and what you have to go through to make your city better. And these decisions have to be made. Somebody has to fill those positions and, 
if we have less and less really good people stepping up, we're not going to see things moving forward in a positive direction for any of our municipalities or any level of government. So that's the double-edged sword. Yes, we're bringing awareness to it right now. And a lot of other places are trying to bring awareness to this. The federal government's working on legislation to kind of prevent it because they see the trend. But how many really wonderful, strong, competent leaders, intelligent people who are connected to their communities will not put their name forward in 2026 or at any time because of this enhanced awareness, right? Well, even on the flip side of that there, Councillor, because how many people will not even come forward if they are being harassed? Because, and if they want to stay anonymous and they want that anonymity that you wanted, but unfortunately, due to the circumstances outside of your control, people knew how many people are going to say, I'm not going to come forward because I now see what the counselor has gone through. So it could happen to me, even if I want to stay anonymous and I don't want it to be a bigger deal and put more sort of fuel on the flames. If you, if you don't mind my analogy, how many people are going to stop doing that? So while you have taken a proactive step and said, yes, it is me, because you could have said uh, no comment. You could have just hung up the phone, but you decided because you are that sort of tough, uh, tough lady that I know and uh, broad shoulders, you want to say, okay, yes, let's tell the story. Let's get this message out. What is the message? What is the message that you want people to know right here, right now that what you've gone through, what is happening with what you have gone through and what other municipal leaders are going through needs to stop? What is that message to people? I think that people just need to be kind. They need to look at the bigger picture. And you know, Chris, I think people are really knee-jerk reaction to a lot of things that they read in the newspaper. And as much as the reporters are, are, are attending council meetings, they will summarize what has ha happened and the decision and maybe use one or two sentences of conversations that councillors have participated in to come to that decision. And people will, are not watching the fulsome debate um, that all of the different councillors are bringing to the table in order to come to that decision that they're so mad about, um, if they would take the time to engage in that way and to have due diligence on their part to learn the entire story instead of just one side of, of a topic, I think people in general will be a lot less angry, right, and reactive. Because then they would be like, you know what, I heard this counselor speak up and he or she had this perspective. They were prepared at the meeting. They came with information and facts that helped them come to that decision instead of just going, oh no, our taxes are going up because of that decision. And just understanding where we're coming from when we're making those tough decisions, because that's what we were elected to do. It's not to just be friends with everyone and you could never please everyone, but just being mindful. Let's just be mindful as grown-ups to be kind. And as much as you want to be upset about a tax increase or a project that a municipal uh, the municipality has approved, reach out in a respectful way to your to your to your leaders and ask them how did you come about this instead of attacking or accusing or or you know accusing us of being corrupt or whatever it is. Understand it better. Do your part to understand it better because, you know, I'm very accessible and very open to people, even if they're not in my ward, they've reached out to me about something else. And I said, you know what, um, I saw your comment online. Uh, you and I don't know one another. I'd really like an opportunity to sit down and have a coffee with you and talk about your concerns because you might be seeing me in a light where who does she think she is or, oh, she thinks she's better than anybody. I can assure you that anyone that sits down with me for five minutes can can tell you that I'm a very genuine person. I'm friendly and approachable. People voted for me because they saw that. If they came to a debate where I was speaking, I came with information. I came with uh, an open mind to speak with everyone. I'm not just elected for my community or my ward, it's for the entire city. And that also helps when we're going out and engaging in the community with events because people get to know us on that personal level. And I think it softens the rhetoric when they see us as human beings, just like them, outside of the title, then they have more respect for us. And that's what my, that's what I encourage. That's what I really want to encourage. Even if someone's being so rude to me, I'm going to give them that opportunity. And if you decide not to, then that's on you. It says something more about you than it does about me and my leadership. But 
Um, you know, no one wants to feel like they're hated or that they're not liked. And I'm a type A personality and a people pleaser. So I'm like, I want you to like me, but because of me being in a genuine person and who I am, not because of my title um, to disparage me because I've stepped up on your behalf to speak for you. I alluded to earlier, I had a woman say, oh, look at the mouth on her. No wonder someone's mad at her to that level. But, you know, I'm proud of the fact that I can be a voice for the people that elected me because if I was quiet and I was um, subdued and I wasn't coming prepared to meetings and I wasn't in engaging in conversation and, and healthy debate and respectful debate at the council table, then I wouldn't be doing my job right? I'm just a rubber stamper. And I don't want to be that. I like to dig deeper. I like to find the truth and the answers and be honest because I signed an oath. I swore an oath of office that I take very, very seriously. Um, and I think that respect goes both ways. And I always try to put that out in the, in the, in the public to anyone as hard as it is sometimes, because it is really a delicate dance sometimes, but people are owed that, even if they've not given that to you first, give them that opportunity. And I'm just really encouraging other municipal leaders to perhaps try that, try that as a first step, right? Instead of just being, oh, this person's rude, I'm blocking them. No, let's have a conversation. Come and meet me as a person and maybe, maybe, just maybe, you're going to have a different perspective. Do you think it's possible? Do you think do you think it's possible that we can change society with more stories? And I hate to say this because I don't want people to go through what you've just gone through, but I'm just going to call a spade a spade here, but it's going to happen. People are going to get bullied tomorrow. People are going to get harassed the day after Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, this week. It's going to happen. And I hate the hat, the fact that I have to say that, but do you, do you have, is there a silver lining in this story that you look and you see in the future and you say, okay, a year from now, this will not be an issue or two years from now, it won't be an issue. Or do you think that because of our society and where we are right now and sort of the polarization that we're seeing, not only federally, but provincially, that municipal politicians just have to sort of grin and bear it over the next few years? You know what? I have hope, Chris, and I think it's just a re on repeat. You just keep repeating the same message over and over because good always wins over evil. I really do believe it. I'm not I don't live in a in a world where it's sunshine and rainbows all the time. Uh, there's a lot of things we have to fix in our world. But when we compare ourselves to where other people live, we're, we've got it pretty good in our in our in our country overall. And, um, you know, not to say like things don't can improve. But if you look at 10 years ago, even. 20 years ago, you and I, when we were growing up, there was a lot of the bullying. Now you've got the anti-bullying days. There's awareness to that. There was not a lot of acceptance for the queer community. And now there's so much more acceptance. And I think that municipal, provincial, and federal uh, leaders are making a difference in that way because we're attending those communities. We're denouncing bullying and hate. We're denouncing uh, all of the, the prejudice and, and uh, hateful rhetoric that it's not welcome in our city. And we're standing in solid to that and they just need to keep being hammered with those messages of positivity um i always say like in a in the middle of a crisis you look for disaster heroes right in a in a way as municipal leaders were that we're, again i want to add that i'm a firefighter to my resume because i'm putting out fires all the time right there's so many things that we can have on our shoulders but i just really feel the consistent messaging and not backing down and saying are you being helpful or hurtful with your comments and just check yourself nice and simple. Are you being okay. helpful or hurt? Right. I'm going to play a little bit devil's advocate with you here for a second, because I do that a lot on the show. There's going to be someone who's watching this and say, you're just squashing free speech. Everyone has the right to say whatever they want. You just have to sort of like the gentleman said to you, toughen up. Just be better. If you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen in some sense. <sighs> Hate the fact that I have to ask, I had to say that, but it's going to be the reality that is going to happen. And I'm probably going to, uh, like, I have filters on our, all of our channels. So that way I don't have to read them and the public doesn't have to read them. But what do you say to those people who are saying that you're just quashing free speech and you just can't handle the fact that someone is criticizing you in a ongoing manner? Let's take a fact that he literally stalked you. Right. <laughs> Let, let's take that part out for a second. And yeah. 
let's talk about the fact that he has said things that are homophobic, that is racist. And there are people out there who will say, it's his right. It's his right to say what he wants to say. What do you say to those people right now who are watching this, who might hear this, or who may be thinking, you know what, I need to stand up and call those people out. What would you say to those people? So first of all, yeah, there is freedom of speech for sure, but there's also legislation against hate speech, right? Where you cross that line. Uh, So that exists out there, right? And there's also uh, workplace harassment rules of of how you know if if people feel harassed and or you know you go there's a disclaimer you walk into all kinds of different offices whether it's government or not and they'll say no level of no tolerance uh, for uh, harassment against our staff will be you know it's there's no tolerance for that so we're seeing more and more it's sad that those signs have to happen at um, clinics. You know, people are yelling at the secretaries and and doctor's offices have such a high turnover because of that stress as well. People are mad about things. Um, But, you know, I had a comment that I read. I've seen it often. Um, You know, he or she needs to be reminded who they work for. Right. (laughs) Um, I understand who I work for. I was elected by the people. The job that I do is for the people always, even if they can't, if they aren't agreeing with how we come to it. And again, it's that education component and doing your due diligence to find out more and not being as reactive. But I was thinking about it the other day and I'm driving and I'm thinking as an employer. So the public is my boss, right? Is that the kind of boss that you want to be? Is that the kind of culture that you want to create in your workplace? If you're my boss, Is that how you want to speak to your employee? Do you think that that employee is going to stick around if you're always disparaging them all the time and never giving them uh, kudos for the good work that they're doing? There's no balance. Is that the kind of boss you want to be? Because if that's the kind of boss you want to be, I'd hate to work for you in the real world, right? Um, Outside of this. And so I kind of had that perspective, like, if you want to be my boss, could it should it not be a respectful relationship? If you want me to be the best that I can be as your employee, would you not want to try and encourage that somehow? Would you not want to have those respectful dialogues with me um, and check ins, right? You know, and and I have a lot of that. So people will call and say, I was watching the council meeting and I really thank you for for speaking up about this, this and this. You were bang on. You were on fire tonight. This was great. But, you know, I'm I'm wondering about this one. Can you maybe talk to me about that? There's not enough people doing that, but there are some. Right. And they, they lead off with in the email or the voicemail. I don't live in your ward. But I'm so inspired by the way that you're speaking up. And I and I read about it in the newspaper. I went back, I watched the council meeting, and I really, I got a different perspective. This is really great. Because of you, I'm paying attention more. A lot of my colleagues just want the fire to fizzle out. They're not, you know, they don't, they don't make waves and that kind of thing. I'm not that kind of leader. But I just think of the perspective. Um, if it's a really a truly an employer versus employee where the public is my boss and I work for them, then you'd want to facilitate a culture of mutual respect and communication so that you can get the best results out of your employee as possible. Why is your first go to to disparage that employee? Because you're never going to get any continuity of of people wanting to work for you if you're going to continue treating them that way, right? So you have now told your story. You have stood up and said, this has happened to me. Um, I want to talk about the future for a second because tomorrow morning, because we're recording this on Sunday, May 26th, tomorrow morning on the 27th, you will get up, you will be the counselor for Ward 7 for the greater Sudbury area, uh, a city. Um, there is a court date on June 19th. I don't want to talk about the the actual court date, but until then, this gentleman cannot talk to you, cannot approach you, cannot have indirect or direct contact with you. But he has his followers, as you've just mentioned. Yeah. And I've got to sort of ask the stupid question again, but have you started getting comments from his followers or has things settled down? in the meantime. So I've definitely been removed from the email list. And I I, I think- <laughs> Sorry, sorry, I shouldn't laugh at that, first, but okay. <laughs> as a first step, I'm, I'm not getting the emails. Uh, but you know, I had a lady call me 
um, the very next day. And she said, you know, I was at the Tim Hortons this morning and he came right out and said, he's the one. And can you believe she's got the nerve to, to charge me, you know? Um, and she said, I just said to him, just stay out of the news. Like, just, why do you got to talk about her for, you know, like, just stop, stop it. Right. We know, you know, and that's the other thing. I don't have a lot of faith in the justice system. Which we're going right? to talk about in two seconds here, because that, that's a very yeah. big wor word that you've just used. And I just want to make sure I clarify it. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not going to, it's like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm stopping getting it in my inbox, but that doesn't mean it's not still happening. Yeah. Right. The disparaging stuff, the snippets, it's still going to happen. Whoever thinks this is okay is going to still feed the beast. They're going to still take pictures of me and he'll just do it in a different way. And the police asked me, what is the end goal of this? Like, what would you like to see as a victim? Right. What's the end goal? Everyone that commits a crime, like, let's say if, um, if you're if you're charged with a really serious crime, and again, this is major crime unit, right? So it's possible. I don't know. I'm not the judge, I'm not the crown attorney. I, I'm not part of that. But the weapon of choice is the access to the internet, right? So that, to me, that weapon needs to be taken away because that's the weapon. And it perpetuates other people to target me, to think that it's okay. And then that that's not helping anybody right because it gets to that unhealthy level where people are stalking you and that's what bothers me i can handle the stuff i can handle all the bad stuff throw it at me i it's okay not okay but i can handle it but when you start mess messaging people and my address is out there the vehicle that i drive um you know, places that and I And showing go. up to your house. That, that like, well, I'm sorry, but that's supposed to be your safe haven. That's supposed to yeah. be your oasis away from everything, in my opinion. I apologize sure. to interrupt there. And, and you know, my husband said to him, we've lived, we, we've known each other for a really long time. And, and when this first started happening, my husband would say to me, would you like me to go talk to this person? And I said, no, I'm a big girl. I can handle myself. This is my work. I don't involve myself in your work. This is my work. He's like, oh, I know, but it, he shouldn't be talking to you. Like it was really starting to affect us as a family, right? To know that this these things were happening. Do you want me to talk to him? No, no, no. And when this happened and he left my house, my spouse went to talk to him and he said, listen, if you have concerns and you're upset about things with the city, that's fine. I've, st I've stayed out of it. But now you came to our home. This is our home, right? She's a person outside of this role. And, you know, as a city councillor, I don't have the ability to force the police chief to bring more rural response to our community to, to deal with people on dirt bikes or whatever's going on. I don't have that ability, but some people think that we do. You know, if someone says something's going on, they, you know, uh, can you make sure that bylaw comes to my house right this minute and fixes this problem? We, don't, we can't do that. We're not, we're not supposed to be micromanaging staff, right? There's, we have, we have a system here called 311 where you would, you know, call into the municipality. Um, and he doesn't like doing that because there's French. There's some French words. It's bilingual. Like my last name is French. Like there's, you know, there's been so many different things. There's been threats made to other people indirectly about the fact that I'm French, that I have a French last name or that I'm associated with the liberals or whatever it is. Um, it just, it just needs to stop. Just stop. You can, you can be, you can hate it all you want. Um, but when, when you bring it to my home, regardless if I'm here or not, uh, stay away from my home, right? You don't go to politicians' homes. It's just, it's not okay on any level. And anybody thinks that that's okay just because we, well, I know where you live. That doesn't matter. You weren't invited here, right? Yeah. And it's different if we were friends and we're known to each other and that kind of thing. We have a cordial relationship. That's no problem. I've had a lady that was thankful because I made, um, I was able to work with some staff and help her out with a planning thing with a permit for her house. And we're very friendly. We have a cordial uh, relationship she asked me 
where I, where I live, she would like to come and, and give me something as a thank you. And I said, you really don't have to, you should really counselor. It really is important for me. I would really like to. And so she came to my house and gave me a gift and thanked me. That was an invitation. Uh, you know, I don't have anybody else, even my neighbors, my neighbors respect, they're not knocking on my door mad about stuff. And they're my neighbors because they, you know, there's that balance. Um, when I first got elected, people um, would start coming to me in social situations and want to always talk about the roads, the potholes, the water bill, whatever. And my spouse had to speak up because I wouldn't because I'm in, about the engagement. And he'd say, I'm getting a t-shirt made and it's going to say when I'm with her, she's off duty, <laughs> right? Because people want to have access to us all the time, which is an expectation, but there is a balance, right? So it's kind of tapering off a lot, a little bit, especially in the community that I live uh, for people to say, Hey, she's out having a nice time playing guitar, singing, whatever's going on. We're not going to bother her with stuff because guess what? I have an email. I have a phone number. You can get a hold of me through social media and I'll answer you through that. I might not do it right away because sometimes we're inundated with a lot of requests, but I am accessible, right? Um, and try to just use those boundaries of accessibility. So where some people, I had one lady that disparaged me through the election completely. I had her block because it was not, it was just not nice. I have the I have the ability as a person to say, you do not, you no longer have access to me. You can still call me, email me, whatever, as a city councillor. And it got to the point where she called the mayor's office and said, you must make her unblock me on social media because I need full access to my counselor because I'm that type of counselor that I engage and I will put things online that have to do with the city, you know, free dump week. Um, recycle bin changes, whatever it is, uh, I'm one of those. So if she's blocked, she doesn't get to see those. So I had a conversation with this person. I said, you know, you and I don't know one another. And that's, you know, we can change that. I, I'm I'm welcome to talk to you and, and meet with you. I'm not sure why you're unhappy with me. I haven't even been elected yet, <laughs> right? <laughs> I just got elected. I don't know. I don't know what, what, you know, I'm always volunteering in my community. I'm really well known and respected. That's why people ask me to run in the first place. Um, but I did unblock her on the condition. If you're going to have respectful dialogue with me, then I will with you. But if you're not going to respect me, then you don't get full access to me. And that's just the, the way that it is, right? That is correct. And I think more and more politicians and municipal leaders should take that advice. I want to go back to a statement that you've mentioned not once, but twice, but you don't have faith in the justice system. And that is a pretty big statement to say. Now, we have anti-hate laws, we have harassment laws in place, but Far be it that you find a court case in the last few years where a municipal politician who's been harassed has actually won a case against someone who's harassed them. Why do you not have faith in the justice system today when you're moving into this next part of this journey? You know, we just need to get tougher. And and I I I really empathize with judges. Our jails are overflowing. They can't keep up. More than 20% of court cases are being diverted out of the court systems because they can't accommodate it any longer. Um, so I I just, I it was, the police were very responsive to me and I never felt that they wanted to minimal, minimize any of it or downplay any of it. Um, and I felt very supportive. I cannot, I, I can't say anything. I, I can say all good things uh, about the process. And uh, even when it first started, just having that dialogue and not being like, oh, don't worry about it. We're used to it. We're used to it. People will say that, but it gets to that point where when is enough enough? Uh, so I just think that municipal, provincial, federal levels of government have to stop ignoring this and try and find a solution uh, we don't need it to escalate to the point where people are feeling unsafe in their workspace, uh, and especially when it spills out into their home life. And um, some people, it's very few, um, but those those people are the ones that 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 definitely need to have some parameters around. Uh, if they can't make those better decisions for themselves and their behaviors, then someone else needs to, and that's when the law steps in. 
So let's leave. Let's let's end on an optimistic note here, counselor, for two seconds, because I said half hour and we're almost at the hour mark. And I feel like I want to throw, throw, throw the interview to you a little bit. What haven't we talked about that you wish people would know or that you want to make sure people know to go forward to help people out who are going through what you went through to ensure that this doesn't happen to other people? What haven't we talked about that you want to make sure goes on the record? I'm not sure. You know, we really did cover a lot. Um, I think the message just need, needs to be not just as a, a female leader, anyone um, that works in all different levels of government to just work together to try and find solutions and uh, support one another, right? Do what we can with the tools that we have available to just try to encourage more positivity and positive engagement with people. Um, and hopefully over time, we're going to see those trends change with more awareness that's being brought out about these issues. At the end of the day, we need people to make legislation and rules and make those tough decisions that most people have opinions on, but don't step forward to make those tough decisions. And um, I would like to have, I would like us to be you know, different levels of leadership where we're working towards solutions to for the betterment of our communities, because that's why we stepped up in the first place, right? Um, so I think if we can just all be mindful and be strong together and support one another that we can get through this. And uh, I appreciate opportunities and platforms like like your show, just to get the word out and, and give other people the strength and courage to speak up and to come to the table. We've got some really great minds right? People coming who step up to these roles to be like, okay, what do we do? What's next? And that's how changes happen, right? If you keep ignoring things or, or pushing it ever under the rug, um, then it's just going to fester and snowball into something that's out of control, uh, like homelessness and the opioid crisis, right? We could have a whole show on that. Uh, you got to get ahead of these types of things and work together to find solutions. So, um, that's what I'd like to end on, right? Um, I'm brave, I'm courageous. Yeah, I have a mouth on me and I use it in a positive way to make some, uh, to use my influence in a positive way in the role that I was elected to do. And I will never apologize um, for having ambition. I'm never going to apologize as a woman for having ambition or speaking up for things that I feel is right because there's never a wrong time to do what's right. And um, some people might say, oh, you know, just, pipe down a little bit, you know, you should just really be quiet. No one's going to dull my shine. Um, people throw rocks at things that shine, you know, that's the Taylor Swift song and it's true. I'm, I'm a big smiley, sparkly person and that's not going to change who I am. And, you know, I had a lady cause she heard on the news that I was going to resign. Um, and she came to me to my workplace, uh, cause I have a full-time career and she was crying. She said, I hope you're not stepping down. And I went, I'm not going anywhere right? Uh, I'm speaking my truth. I have that strong conviction to do that. And that, that's not going to change. Uh, and I really appreciate an opportunity to just kind of set the record straight. And um, just to kind of have a really fulsome dialogue and conversation about the importance of, of boundaries and, and our role uh, as the public and engaging with your politicians and how that can be a really positive interaction. And that's what I want to focus on. We always talk about breaking the glass ceiling and more and more people need to help break that glass ceiling to ensure that these type of situations don't ever happen again. You have made a big crack in that glass ceiling by standing up and telling your story in the manner that you have and explaining that this is not okay. And more and more people need to say and stand up and help break that glass ceiling by saying enough is enough. We need to move on because if we lose people like you in municipal politics and municipal governance, I think our country is in a worse shape. I think there's a lot more Natalie's out there who are looking at you and looking at you as a potential trailblazer in their own mind. And I hope you stay in there and you hang in there like you have been and you stand on those shoulders that you're still standing on and just 
continue to be the greatest counselor that you can be because truly you have inspired me in our last conversation last year and in this conversation. So thank you so much for telling your story, for doing what you're doing and just inspiring so many people across this country to stand up and say enough is enough. Thank you. And I appreciate it. Thanks so much, Chris. Now, we want to thank the counselor for sharing her story with us today on Municipal Affairs. If you haven't already, hit that subscribe button now. Stay in the loop with all our diverse content that we have coming up over the next few weeks. And if you can, consider backing the show. Stories like this need to be told, and we're hoping that by telling these stories, you can stay informed and engaged on the issues that are facing our municipal leaders and our municipalities across this great country. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, but as always, just keep talking.